Sawa de Cup. Back to four hour work week in the adventures of Tibbe. Tim Ferriss, the man, the myth, the legend. Lifestyle design in action. I was done with driving across town to collect my son from childcare, only to slide across icy highways trying to get back to work with him in tow to finish my work. My mini retirement brought us both life brought us both to live at an alternative boarding school full of creative lifestyle redesigning children and staff in a gorgeous Florida forest with a spring-fed pond and plenty of sunshine. You can easily search for alternative schools or traditional schools that might accept your children during your stay. Alternative schools often see themselves as supportive communities and are exceptionally welcoming. You might even find an opportunity to work at a school where you could experience a new environment with your child. Deb, well, there you go. A little something different. You have children. You put them in an alternative school in Florida. Florida man. You see Florida man a lot in the news. And I think it's pretty funny. Still love Florida. Even with, <laughs> in spite of Florida man showing up in the news. And still love Florida. Flaws and all. Florida's cool. Tim, your book and blog have inspired me to quit my job, write two ebooks, skydive, backpack through South America, sell all the clutter in my life, and host an annual convention of the world's top dating instructors. My primary business venture, third year running. The best part, I can't even buy a drink yet. So he's like under legal drinking age and he's done all this crap. Thank you so much, bro. Yeah, there it is. Anthony. Good for Anthony. So, obviously, like I said, this is the revised and expanded edition. Right there, revised and expanded. So, we're going to see some stuff, you know, after the original book was written. So, he wrote it in 07, and that dude in between 07 and 09 was inspired by the book to do all that stuff he just talked about. All right, here's what I'm interested in, because I, I took a little sneak peek uh, ahead. Rules that change the rules. Yes, let's change the rules. I'm a little bit of an anarchist, you know, a little bit of a pirate, an outlaw. So, stuff like that excites me. Everything popular is wrong. Yes, go against the grain. Investing and thinking, really. I can't give you a surefire formula for success, but I can give you a formula for failure. Try to please everybody all the time. That's, just, that's amazing, because I was just thinking before I did this video... I was going to say something about, as this channel grows, because, you know, we, we started at, I don't know, less than 20 subscribers, friends of mine, and we're almost to, uh, to 80 now. Um, it, it, it's not that I don't want to please people. I'm just old enough to know that it's impossible to please everybody. <laughs> um, I'm not even sure I've ever tried that, but I know it doesn't work, because I've seen with other people who try to please people. And it just doesn't work. There's always going to be somebody unhappy or critical. Uh, was it thumbs up, thumbs down, or whatever? There's always going to be haters. There's always going to be people that aren't a fit for you. And I've stated several times on this channel, I don't care. And I've also said it's incredibly freeing. And this is what I mean by that. If I sat and paid attention to negative comments, which so far there haven't been any, um, but they're coming because as the channel grows, there's going to be people who are just, and, and then here's the next step is I understand because I've got the giant head and big thick glasses that those people are not unhappy with me or the content. They're unhappy with themselves. Ooh, Sigmund Freud, right? But it, it's true. If you think about it, anybody who would leave a negative comment on the internet to, you know, learning material like this. Okay. So if it didn't work for you, so what? Who the fuck are you? Like, nobody cares. And they're hurt that nobody cares. They want their opinion to count. They want their voice to count. So negative feedback on the Internet is nothing more than people saying, my voice counts. And, and if you actually question the person, if I met them one-on-one -on -one and talked to them and said, what did you not like about this thing? So strongly that you had to go and post a negative comment or give a thumbs down or whatever. And there's, there's nothing there. It's just, they just want to be heard. They desperately need to be heard. They're living a life. They're not paying attention to the things in this book. They're living a life where nobody even notices they're alive. It's sad, but it's true. It's, it's, you know, they're not winners. They're not achievers. They don't have what it takes 
and they to to have success and they're not even going to try they're giving up before they even start to fight that's their choice that's and and you know you reap what you sow and they're going to live a pretty sad life because of that so when they're reaching out when they're lashing out on the internet and in negative it's just that they're, they're filled with negative and they're just spitting out you know the poison the vitriol the 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 stuff that's inside them that's all they have to give does that make sense that's all those people have to give they're not positive they're not successful so they're going to try to tear you down right crabs in the bucket i talked about that before when you go crabbing you don't need to put a lid on the bucket because as one crab starts to crawl out and try to go over the top the other crabs will pull them down that's what the negative people on the internet are they're the crabs pulling people down in the bucket is what it is so very interesting that quote was pretty timely because honestly i was thinking about that as you know the, the channel keeps growing i'm like yeah you're gonna get some haters okay <laughs> it's not gonna stop me <laughs> it's not gonna affect my life one bit so there is that can't please everybody all the time a hey, fucking man herbert bayard swope american editor and journalist first recipient of the pulitzer prize man yeah, I like obscure shit like that. I really do. Like, I never heard of Herbert Bayard Swope before. So, you know, listen to Timmy, read Timmy, and you hear about Herbert Bayard Swope, the first recipient of the Pulitzer Prize. I, I think that's cool. Everything popular is wrong. Well, that just flat out says it. Ah, Oscar Wilde, there you go. Once again, the, the, the wild man. Uh, Oscar Wilde, the importance of being earnest. Right. Everything popular is wrong. The longer you live, the more you see that's correct. Dancing with the stars. <laughs> What's that all about? I don't, I don't get it. Beating the game, not playing the game. In 1999, sometime after quitting my second unfulfilling job and eating peanut butter sandwiches for comfort, I won the gold medal at the Chinese kickboxing. San Shu National Championships. Okay, here he goes about the hack. Remember I told you when he talked about being the kickboxing champion before he cheated? You know, life hack. Oh, there you go. He's going to break it down here. So beating the game, not playing the game. I think you keep that in mind as we, as we read through this. Um, it wasn't because I was good at punching and kicking. God forbid. That seemed a bit dangerous considering I did it on a dare and had four weeks of preparation, right? So not enough time to do it legit, to do it the standard way. So that was his inspiration for coming up with the, the hack. Uh, besides, I have a watermelon head. It's a big target. He does have a big head. <laughs> and he's unfortunately bald. He had male pattern baldness in his 20s. You know, he wore hats and shit and tried to hide it. Now he's just, he's 40. He's like, fuck it. You know, he, like I said, he's becoming a stoic and... and you just don't give a shit, and that's a good thing in a lot of ways. It really is. Uh, I won by reading the rules and looking for unexploited opportunities, of which there were two. So the first thing he did was study the rules. If he's going to play the game, if he's going to beat the game, he needs to know the game. So he read the rules. Weigh-ins were the day prior to competition, so he had 24 hours to alter his weight after he, uh, a weigh-in. Using dehydration techniques commonly practiced by elite power lifters and Olympic wrestlers. So he's been into sports science his whole life. So he was already familiar with wrestlers um, dehydrating and, and going on diets and all that um, to lose weight, to, to get down to a lower bracket. And then they rehydrate and now they're heavier and that gives them a little bit of an advantage in the ring. So that was already a common practice. He didn't invent it. I lost 28 pounds in 18 hours. Pretty fucking extreme. But still, he, he just used an existing technique that Olympic wrestlers were using and power lifters. Uh, weighed in at 165 pounds and then hyperhydrated. Hyper being the opposite of dehydrated so that he, he bloated up with as much water as he could possibly hold. And I wouldn't recommend you do this. That's not good to play with your body like that. You'll, you'll fuck it up and throw it out of balance. Uh, back to 193 pounds. So he's almost 200 pounds. But he's now he qualified for the 165-pound weight class. That's a huge advantage. It's hard to fight someone from three weight classes above you. Yeah, that's a huge divide. 
poor little guys. <laughs> Number two, there was a technicality in the fine print. If one combatant fell off the elevated platform three times in a single round, his opponent won by default. I decided to use this technicality as my principal technique and just push people off. I mean, 30 pounds heavier, right? It's easy. As you might imagine, this did not make the judges the happiest Chinese I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, they wanted him to come out and fight and play by the traditional rules, kind of like the Canadian coaches for the skiing guy. They wanted him to, you know, work and commit and put the hours in because that's what they'd always seen and that's what they thought worked. He didn't do it. He won gold. He didn't do it. He won whatever the hell this championship was. So, so now you see right there. That's his secret, right? Or yeah, ten minutes. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta wrap this up quick. Where does the time go? Uh, the result: I won all my matches by technical knockout TKO, and went home national champion. Something ninety-nine percent of those with five to ten years of experience had been unable to do. Four weeks. But isn't pushing people out of the ring pushing the boundaries of ethics? Not at all. It's no more than doing the uncommon within the rules. The important distinction is that between official rules and self-imposed rules. Consider the following example. Okay, they're going to do Olympic Olympics in Mexico. It's already after 10 minutes. That's it. We'll just we'll end with him being Chinese kickboxing champion. Um, and, and he'll go into, in, into more the difference between self-imposed rules and official rules. So thinking outside the box is the takeaway today. Not trying to be a national Chinese kickboxing champion by, you know, exploiting uh, the openings and the rules. I, I think of racing, too, when he talks about that. Um, I used to drag race my Impala SS at a 396, for those who know what that means, <laughs> 396 cubic inch uh, stroker. It was a 350 Chevy, um, bored out in the machine shop to take bigger pistons. And the reason you, and, and have a longer stroke of the crank, and the reason you do that is the more gas and air you burn, the more power you make. The bigger the motor, up to a certain extent, uh, the faster you go. So... I drag raced the Impala. I won a trophy at the Impala SS event in Arlington, Texas. I drove from Florida with a couple other buddies from the club and uh, drag raced my car. won a big trophy, which I kept until I moved here because it was just, you know, when I was packing two suitcases, there was a lot of shit I left behind. But I had that damn trophy upstairs in my office, in my house, um, you know, up till 2020, 19, you know, 1920. Uh, fun. Had a blast. Drag racing. And, and in drag racing, bracket racing, you do, you know, the, you, you search for advantages. So there's the rules and, every, you know, everybody's got to have the same size motor. Everybody's got to do this. Everybody's got to do that. There's all different rules and different aspects of racing. So you go through the rules and you look for any advantage you can get over the next guy. This is kind of the same thing. So I, I called it cheating. That was harsh. He, he didn't cheat. It was, there was a rule if your opponent goes out of the ring three times, you win. So he pushed his opponent out. How did he push his opponent out? There was a rule that said you weigh in the day before. So he was able to drop a bunch of weight, mostly using controlling water and being extremely dehydrated, which is not healthy and not good, uh, and then hyperhydrating. So not only getting back to normal, but oversaturating his body and having way too much water. And it, I, once again, I wouldn't recommend that for anybody, but that's how he was successful. By being almost 30 pounds heavier than all his opponents, he could simply grab them and push him out. Push him out of the ring with his superior weight. So, life hack. He, he examined it on a challenge, on a dare from friends. You know, when you're young, you do stupid stuff like that. You know, I don't think he has anything to prove to anybody. He wouldn't do it today. Like I said, he's, if you listen to his stuff now, he's, he's coming from a, a different place, a better place in my opinion. Age has a way of doing that, mellowing us uh, crazy assholes. And uh, so says the guy who got on a motorbike for a second time in his life and friggin' dumped it. But, uh, you know, yeah, we're always going to be a little crazy. Guys like us, that's the price you pay. Uh, but I wouldn't trade me and me, and I'm sure Tim wouldn't trade me and him for anything in the world. So it is what it is. You learn to uh, accept more as you get older. That's all. Well. <clears throat> all right. So that, that's it for today. Chinese kickboxing. That's how you become a Chinese kickboxing champion in four weeks. <laughs>
Well, they just it, it's important to take away is just look at things from a fresh perspective. Look at look at different things different ways than you're used to and you've been taught to think. That's kind of the whole essence of this book. So, y'all have a good one.